Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. This time we are looking at a Jammer Arcade PCB. This is a bootleg of Punisher, I think. I did uh, wonder <laughs> what that said there. P U N something something H E R. So uh, yeah, I went away and looked at MAME to try and work out what games might resemble those letters there. And the Punisher, I think, is what it is. And I compared on eBay, I looked at bootlegs on eBay, and they seem identical. The key is, well, all of the chip placements and things on here, but that's uh, Actel. Um, ASIC there, it's probably a programmable part, you know, CPLD, something like that. Um, you can see it's got a Motorola 68000 CP10, so it's uh, rated at 10 megahertz. You can see a wire there, it's a factory mod by the looks of things, you know, these were cheaply assembled and thrown together, uh, and it looks like uh, there was a mistake on the PCB and the root of wire from the, uh, uh, is that a ROM? Yeah, 27C4000 ROM there underneath the CPU when it comes out uh, on the pin there. There's a little bit of blobby solder there that makes me wonder what's happened to that. Now, I have just tested this, I'll show you in a sec. The first thing I noticed, it was only outputting 4.6 volts, the power, it's showing 4.6 volts on the, the 5 volt rail. So I cleaned up here, still looks very fuzzy, can you see that? But we get no video or anything, no activity. And I'll show you that in a second, but uh, now I had briefly had a quick look at this uh, previously. Um, you know, look over the board, see if you can see any damage. There's a few scratch traces on the underside, I'll show you those in a minute, but I've just scratched them further, you know, the coating off the surface, and they look okay, they're not broken. But can you see here? We've got some damage around here, I'll give you a macro on this in a minute. But a chip has been removed off this. Now, you might be wondering what the part number is, but the clues are here. It says 174, that says F283, 378, F283. So the actual part numbers, uh, you know, the 74 series number is on here. So I know that I need to fit either a HC or LS174 there. Um, and just deal with the broken pad there. The pad is missing and it joins to a trace that comes to a wire down here. So I'll have a wire from here, I'll prepare that on the top side first and I'll route it underneath the socket and then we'll fit the socket, solder it on and stick a 174. But before I do that, let me just show you it's doing nothing. So we've got our jammer edge over there. Plug the super gun on. Uh, now I did just check something. Before you power something like this on, do check it's jammer and the pin out is what you're expecting. So the red on here on the Molex is five volts. So before I powered it on, I did a quick connectivity test, I'll show you, to one of the uppermost pins on the 74 series and I had a direct connection. So that gave me confidence that this jammer connector is the right way up. If you go the right wrong way around, the five volts will probably end up somewhere else. So I'm pretty confident that this is, well, hopefully, this is the right way up. And if I power this on, you'll see nothing. Nothing at all, it's just doing nothing. I'm just feeling around the tops of things here. Nothing really gets warm at all, apart from the CPU after a minute or two, it gets a little warm. But yeah, it's a good test to do. Uh, but obviously, before you do that, you really should just see if you've got enough uh, and the correct voltage there. You can see that 4.9 volts there. So it's a bit better from having been disconnected and reconnected a few times, where we have got 4.9 volts. But it isn't doing anything. Uh, now, my thoughts are, could be this, if you've not got this in here, Maybe this has got some, you know, central functionality to do with the video or, you know, it, it could just be stopping it completely dead in its tracks. The fact that that 174 is missing there, it's a possibility, but that might be, you know, just some damage that's been inflicted after this fault started and someone went, oh, the fault one, that's too complex, let's just scrap it. Uh, and of course there could be uh, some more damage elsewhere like that, that I haven't noticed yet, but yeah, nothing is getting hot. Nothing is getting hot. There's a lot of chips on here. We've got some lukewarm chips up here. Just there. That's lukewarm. Everything else is pretty cold, actually. It's missing the uh, audio amplifier as well. I can show you that in a second. Should really be wearing an ST wrist strap while I'm doing this, but you know what? This board has probably been thrown around no end. I think a little bit of ESD for me is the least of this board's worries right now. So I'll get a 16 pin socket, you can see the pad there is missing and as I say it goes to a wire, I think the wire is just down there, it's the second of those two traces that's missing so uh, yeah I'll deal with that first. I can probably deal with it from the underside actually, I'll just uh, I'll join it to that wire on the underside of the PCB. However I do need to order some more 16 pin sockets, I think that one's going to be 
yeah that one's going to be just the ticket for that thing let's just try and line that up yeah that should do uh, so the pins are mostly unblocked there's just the odd one down here that uh, do need a little bit of uh, unblockage let's just have another go at that it's the pants are right state here let's just try a little bit of braid on there actually Yeah, that's not too bad. Let's see if a socket will go on. So I pin one at the top. Yeah, one or two of the holes here are a little bit blocked. And I think that third from bottom there, well, the hole looks tiny. Let's, uh, let's just give that one a go. That's a bit better. Yeah, it's almost going on. So inspecting that, there are actually three fixed wires required. Uh, I think I've got the right chip here. The pads are so blooming small, I can't even see. Yeah, that's right, I can feel it heating on the other side. Um. Yeah, they've got super small pads. If you compared this to an original Punisher, I'm pretty sure there'd be a huge difference in quality. So I've made a note, I've done a little diagram here of where I need to stick my three wires in a minute. Uh, I would hope that after we've done this we get some video, because if we can get some video even if it's corrupted or, I don't know, it's just not booting but we're getting a black screen or something, it's better than the situation we're in at the moment. And of course this might not be saveable. I could be faced with hours messing around with the logic uh, probe or a logic analyzer yet. I don't know, we'll just, uh, let's just hope. I hope we've got some video to give us something to go on. There we go, that's not too bad. So, the next thing is the wires. So I drew this diagram. This was the uh, trace that was obviously broken and went to the via, but the pad here was awful, needed to go to a via, and the second pin down looked okay, but there was a break there, so I have to join it to the chip next to it. So I've got the three wires here, I need to clean up and stuff, I'm not going to do that now, I'm going to go and test it. So if we just uh, flip this over, let's get a 174 in there, I'm not sure whether I've got any actually, I may have one. So when working on something this complex, uh, you need to start with the basics. We've done the voltages, 5 volts, 12 volts. I haven't shown you, but 12 volts is on one of the op-amp, uh, you know, the amplifier pins up here, not the op-amp, there's an actual main amp, amp uh, output. But the amp is missing, but there's a 12 volts on there. Uh, nothing on the board is getting hot, that's another thing. Well, here, this gets warm. Uh, the ROMs are all cold, the RAMs are cold. These here get warm, these are bus transceivers. Um, everything looks okay there, though. Um, We've got some gals on here, those worry me a little bit, and obviously the CPLD that you've seen down there. Uh, but anyway, nevertheless, basics. So there's a big solder blob there handily. I don't know why. That worries me in case the wires come off that on the reset. And if I just probe that with a logic probe, you can see it's high. Let me just cycle the power. Now, this worries me a little bit, but you see it go high. It goes low there when the power goes off. It seems to be just stuck high. Now, I have just tried temporarily with a wire joining from ground to there and just temporarily shorting that. It doesn't seem to make a difference. So, I don't think there's a reset problem, but there could be. This is the sort of thing where if I probe that with a logic analyzer, you know, I've got a logic analyzer on here, I may see a short, lower pulse. Because this is running fast, 10 megahertz fast, or faster, I'm not sure, it's uh, it might not register as a low for very long, you know, to the eye, you might not see it. This is the problem. Uh, but anyway, that's that, and then that's 18, I think, 17, 16, 15. That's the clock, and you can see that. We've got green and red, so it's pulsing. So the clock would appear to be going there. Now, other things you want to do, you can see I've not got the video connected, man, but see if you get any video. Well, we're not getting any video at all. The next thing is audio. Can we hear anything? Well, the amplifiers are missing, so I can't even test audio. And this is the problem with something like this. This makes this even more 
harder to work on because we've got no audio we've got no video we have no indications not even any leds or anything on here there are no jumpers or dip switches so it's not like it could be in the wrong mode or somewhere like there's nothing to go on at all so the next thing i'm going to do is flip the board over because the uh, rgb connections i think uh, and uh, sync in particular sync is on the underside of the jammer connector but one thought i did have is there's some resistors here that i know on the super gun that i know are used to attenuate the red green blue and sync signals so maybe uh, the jammer super gun is the issue here maybe it's attenuating too much or something like that or maybe there's a fault on the video so if i switch that off we flip this over here and we'll bring the crusty scope in now this has got a sample rate of like i don't know 20 megahertz or something you can scope signals up to about 10 megahertz it's not very good and even when you're right within the sample range there it's crap to be honest but it should be sufficient to show us if there's any activity on the rgb and sync now I forget exactly which ones are which here these resistors that's what i'm going off i think the sync is somewhere down here but we'll check that in a minute anyway if i just uh, support this up with something just so you can see it it's going to be difficult trying to get the light off there you go you can see that um i've not got the scar connected at the moment but trust me there is no video coming out to the tv at the moment and if we go along here now i think it's probably going to be something like sync rgb or something like that you can see there we've got activity oh, let's just try and hold it there just let go can you see we are getting something out there hang on i've got to hold it in position you can see a little peaks and if we go along here let's have a look at the next one again look at that and we've got different levels that shows me we've got different things on the display it's not just like one static colour or something the same there look we've got activity uh, now somewhere along here we're going to get to the sync and I think that maybe that's it yeah I think that is a sync uh, and then what's the next one here these might be something else like switching the TV into the right mode and stuff like that because there's no activity on those last two but the first four there some of that fourth one's got me interested because I think that's sync it would appear we do have some output so maybe my TV just doesn't like the output from this I think what I'm gonna have to try and do here now is connect up the uh, Commodore 1084s monitor actually because that's analog there's more chance of it displaying something so let me go and get that monitor set up and we'll see if we get any more video with that so I think I'm gonna have to revisit this monitor there must be something missed because it made a, a fuzzing noise a minute ago high voltage or something like something arcing come out of the way Luigi look I can hear it now out of the way don't know you could hear that look something's wrong So I spent the last 20 minutes taking my monitor apart. You can see there's something not right with it though. It's like bobbing up and down a bit. So there's definitely some faults still with my monitor that were missed in previous repairs. Uh, but I haven't used it in a long time. It's got bugs and all sorts inside it. Maybe there's a bug arcing somewhere. That's like, wants to collapse the frame there, doesn't it look? But the main thing is you can see the game is actually working graphics kind of look okay don't they it's just just the brightness and contrast ah yeah we've got some corruptions here look so we've got a fault but it's on the video side of things isn't it yeah it's just on sprites look the main background stuff looks fine you can see occasionally it's bobbing up and down there we have another cap problem there there must be a cap that I missed somewhere it might not necessarily be a cap, but I heard some arcing when I first switched on. Now I took the back off and I looked, look, I can't see anything at all. I powered it on without the back on and it wasn't arcing, so really difficult to diagnose a fault like that. But temperature, you know, a spray might help. Um, so I'll have a look at that later, that'll be another video. But the main thing is you can see, it's booting. So what looked like a completely dead board wasn't a completely dead board when you connect it to a suitable display. A modern LCD, even with the super gun there, uh, wasn't working. The interesting thing is I'm still using the super gun so it must be about the frequency and stuff um, you know the LCD just doesn't like it maybe it doesn't like the sync signal but it's displaying okay on here but yeah you can see we've got corruptions on the sprites 
but all of the background tiles, all of the sort of artwork up here and stuff, like the stuff on the interface, I'm a little stretched off the left because I need to adjust the width of it. It's, uh, it's looking okay, and obviously we've got no sound because the amplifier is missing. Now, the thing that can make faults like this quite difficult to diagnose on this kind of board, a bootleg, is there are no schematics for this. Uh, what I can do is have a look at the CPS 1.5 board and see how that works and then see if I can see how they might have replicated it on this board. That's probably what I'll have to do. So I'm going to go away and dig up uh, the uh, one point, CPS 1.5 because I think that's what well, this is uh, a clone of. CPS 1.5 schematics. So ignore the bobbing up and down. Just to test it again without the 74174 here. It's a LS174 I'm using. I'm just curious to see what that chip was doing. Obviously the game is working without it. Um, it's going to be interesting if it worked completely without it. <laughs> it might point to a problem in that area. I'm not sure what's missing at this stage. Some of the sprites maybe? I don't know. That looks sort of normal so far, apart from the flickering, but as I said, that's my monitor. Let's just wait and see what happens. There's a chance that the part I've got here is wrong. It might need to be an F174. Maybe there's actually nothing wrong with this other than the sound. Yeah, look, it's subtly different here. So someone had targeted approximately the right area of the board, I think. Can you see it's like really blocky now? So we're in the right realms here. It's the sprite data. That component has been a clue. I don't know that Electron has removed that himself, but look, it's super blocky. I'll switch it off, stick the chip back in. It's kind of helped me out big, big time on this, really, because I haven't even had to go look at the schematics yet, have I? But I will do. And we'll try that again. I'm guessing it's not going to be quite as pixelated. So all that kind of looks the same so far. Uh, yeah, the sprites are different. They're different. There is more detail there now. There was less detail without that IC there. Well, you're not going to believe it. The uh, 174 didn't have a supply. That's what it was. You can see the sprites are back. Uh, now, there's an interesting thing going on with these black bits here. Can you see? It's like the transparencies, perhaps, aren't working. Well, I don't know. They're working on sprites. Maybe that's normal. I need to go and have a look at some uh, captures, but you can see joysticks working. Obviously, we're missing sound. I don't know how complete the game it is. Yeah, I'm not sure about these lines through the blues, either. you got lines here, look. So, maybe there's a problem with transparencies. But you know what? That's actually playable. Well, apart from the flickering. The flickering just could be uh, a problem with the sync circuit, actually. It could even be the super gun attenuating the uh, sync level. In fact, it will be. That's probably what it is. I could temporarily bypass the sync. Because this monitor is going to be... Well, I don't know, actually, because the way I've configured this monitor, it's got a sync... Uh, combiner hasn't it this jammer board is going to be out in like you know output like TTL level sync probably so there is some attenuation going on maybe that's why it's not displaying probably it could also be a problem with my monitor still I'm surprised though because what we're left with now I think is dealing with an audio problem and then just trying to work out I don't know, some of these minor issues, like, yeah, not sure. Now, the interesting thing is, without the 174, let me just show you, the background shouldn't be purple like that, blue, whatever, so we've got a problem there, and you can see the sprites get messed up, and that's without a 174. Uh, now, I'm temporarily taking risk by doing this, I'm just inserting the chip while it's on, can you see that? That's okay, but look at the bar up here, it's just black. As soon as I remove it, it goes blue again. So, there is something going on around that 174. Maybe I need to remove that socket again and just thoroughly inspect the connectivity around there. Maybe there's a bad connection. But I haven't seen some weird behaviour there. When you remove it, the colours look normal, you stick it back in, the sprites are fixed, but the colours go a bit weird on the, the score, you know, the health bars and things. I thought, maybe there's a trace here, but struck it back off and inspected and there's nothing wrong it's got the same issues it needed a fixed wire here to that wire it needed a uh, fix i think from here oh hang on 
maybe not I don't know I'll double check that one maybe that's the issue um, and a fix here and the VCC was missing so there were like three fixes around there all the other pins look okay there are some unused ones here I'm just going to take a, a, a close-up photo on my phone there because I am convinced that there is something around here now you can see these gold dots I've gone over literally most of the board with a logic probe and also piggybacking um, because if there is a fault there you will see a change in behavior it might not necessarily fix the issue but you should see a change in behavior and piggybacking each one of these chips and I've done I don't know, 6, 70, 80 of them maybe um, no change at all it's not taken very long to do that uh, but anyway nevertheless I'm going to get a new socket back on here fix the uh, three or so connections that need fixing and retest it but that one there in particular maybe because the pad's missing maybe I missed it I don't know well, I think I spent all afternoon chasing my own tail, actually, because having redone the socket on that chip is fine now. As you can see, the bar, blue bars are okay. I knew there was something there, because, like I say, the sprites were okay when the 174 was in, but then the bars were weird, and transparency, so now it seems okay. Uh, I really wish I knew what that flickering was. Yeah, I think that's okay. So, I just need to fix the sound now. There are some differences. But you know this is a bootleg so there's bound to be and when i say differences i mean like the backgrounds are like blue instead of black i don't think that's a fault i actually think they've done a change to it and i said that all oh, this looks okay i might just check the intro out again actually to see if the intro looks any different let's just power cycle it yeah can you see that blue should be blue that should be black on the original one Maybe that's a bootleg difference. It's amazing, they removed all the Capcom stuff, but on the high score table it still says Capcom Systems, Capcom Systems. You would think, if they were going to go to the trouble, and you can see what I mean here, presented by, doesn't say Capcom. Uh, and the same here. It's, uh, it's weird how they've done that. This should be black, not blue. So, I'm not really sure. But the majority of this looks okay. I mean, obviously, you saw a flicker there. I'm not sure if that flicker's normal there. Yeah, that just sort of flickers on and off, doesn't it, there? Is that normal? I don't know. kind of looks all right, doesn't it? it? It literally is just some sort of palette difference. Just testing that monitor again quickly with my Amiga. You can see it's rock solid stable. So the instability's there. It's going to be something to do with the, the sync signal, I think. Uh, I could have a look at that further and see see what's going on. It could be the super gun that's just attenuating the signal too little or too much. It's not obviously designed that arcade board to be used with a super gun. It's designed to connect to the monitor. Obviously, it's got like say TTL level sync. But my monitor's okay, so that arcing noise at the beginning it could have been a dead bug or something because there were a few bugs inside there when I, I had a look inside it uh, and it never did it after I first showed you the issue when I first switched it on I'll test it again tomorrow so this is the following day <laughs> it's crazy the amount of dots I stuck on these chips yesterday seriously uh, it, you might think that would have took, taken ages and you know what I did spend the whole day messing with this board but actually testing these 7.4 series here there's probably 7 or 8 different types of chips here you know it's like these 163's you've got 163, 163, uh, 163, 163, 163 some more 163's uh, and it's the same with the 157's there's about 7 or 8 157's so it's like it doesn't take very long uh, now if you are doing a piggyback test the way I did it I did it hot swapping which is really risky you could damage the board but you know what this is a piece of garbage this board seriously it really is this is not a proper Capcom board. If this was a Capcom board, I think I would go at it a little bit slower and I wouldn't be uh, hot swapping chips, uh, you know, with a piggyback approach. Uh, I might spend more time with the scope and stuff, and actually, the schematics would lend itself to that. What I mean by that is, we knew there was a problem with sprites, I'd be able to look at the schematics and perhaps work out the issue. Now, as things transpire, actually, I looked at the official version of this board and it's an ASIC you know the actual PPU picture processing unit a bit like we've got the uh, you know the, the, the uh, ASIC down there it's a programmable part probably it's uh, you know large pin count uh, ASIC so if you get problems with sprites and things on the original board you just need to swap it and it's a Rico branded chip 
Uh, and now those Ricoh branded chips, in my mind, are notorious. You remove them with hot air, they never work again. You've got to be very, very, very careful in terms of the temperature you use to remove Ricoh chips. But anyway, that's just my experience from the SNES, and I'm sure uh, Argon uh, on uh, Twitter would uh, reflect that same information. In fact, it was only when he mentioned it, I thought, oh, so it's not just me then. <laughs> it's not just me. Every time I've come across a Rico chip on a SNES, uh, you, you can have a part one that's partial, you remove it with hot air, put it under the board, doesn't work at all. And you're like, what's going on? It was partial before. You put it back on the original board, it doesn't work anymore. And making sure, obviously, you take any SD protection and stuff, but those Rico chips, they do not survive well. Anyway, this is the following day. The way I left things, I didn't show you. I was trying to work out the audio circuit here because we've got a missing amplifier in the back. We've got a crusty looking, what I thought was a DAC here. It turns out it's a bit more than a DAC, actually. Uh, and an op amp here. It's a 324 it's a Gold Star, GL324. No sound out of this, so I'm thinking, hey, what can we do to get sound? Uh, now, I scoped a few things, and I was convinced, actually, and I looked at the pin out of this, the uh, digital, um, the PCM audio comes out of that pin there. I'll show you that in a second. So what I've done today, I'll just try and do this without short and everything here. I've got this thing from Allison. This is a little operational amplifier. It's got an op amp in there, a battery. You can hear it buzzing. Uh, I've connected up a phono lead here, flakily, with a couple, hang on, let me just make sure they're not showing, a couple of these little uh, croc clips. Got one to the ground there, one here. If I touch the point where I believe the DAC output is here, nothing at the moment, put a credit in. Hang on. I think I've got to press start, actually. Yeah, I've got to press start. Let's try that again. Did you hear that? There we go. So we have sound, surprisingly. Now, if you're anything like me, you'd be wondering, where is the sound coming from on this board? Because if you're familiar with the proper CPS uh, 1.5, there's a Z80. There's no Z80 on this board. You've seen the 68000. We've got a pick here. It's this pick. The pick is emulating, in, in quotes, the Q sound of the original CPS uh, board there. Um, and it's got its own ROM here, I think. Uh, and there's probably a RAM somewhere around here for that. It might even have some internal RAM. But nevertheless, the pick is the thing that is doing all the sound generation. So, as you can imagine, the sound is going to be pretty crusty on something like this compared to an original Capcom board. And this is another reason why I come back to what I said before. It's a piece of junk. But you know what? I'm going to give this uh, the love that it deserves as a historic piece of junk. Um, because I think it's interesting. It's interesting, and I'll talk a bit about that later. It's interesting how it's been, uh, you know, cloned this way. And um, yeah, I'm just fascinated. I'm always fascinated by these uh, clone uh, boards. You know, the amount of work that must have gone into reverse engineer this. All right, for somebody who's super, super, super intelligent and on the on the top of their game, like Stephen Leary. So the, you know, a few hours of the logic analyzer and just a quick glance over the board, and they might have it all sussed out. But when it comes to the P PPU side of things, the picture processing unit, you know, all that functionality was embedded within a single ASIC on the original CPS boards. I'll stick a photo up actually. And it just makes you realize that, in particular, the PPU must take quite a while to reverse engineer. But one thing that does appeal to me about these junk boards is. You know, they've exploded out. The PPU sort of sits here, I think, and have exploded the functionality out around here into all this 7.4 series. So you'll notice that when, when I was testing, it went all the way up here, even though we were doing with Sprice, I thought, well, these are nothing to do with Sprice. How do I know that? Because it's right next to the work RAM and work ROMs and things here, main program code. Because I'm guessing what we've got here are program ROMs, program RAM, you know, work RAM next to the CPU. It makes sense to logically stick those there. And some of this address decoding here is, and the gals and things are going to be to do with the bank switching and stuff around there. Whereas by the time you get down here, you've got a lot more ROMs. What does this tell you? It's going to be graphic data. These are going to be the uh, character ROMs, you know, sprites, background, uh, artwork, text, etc. Uh, and some more uh, RAMs, I think. And that kind of fits with, you know, this here. If you look at the CPS1 board, I'll stick a photo up again. This is going to be replicating the PPU because there's no other customs. It might be doing some of the arbitration or some something to do with the the, the Z80 side of things. Maybe this is you know not just doing the graphics. Maybe there's some sound stuff built in here. But the fact that the pick chip is right up over there, 
I think not. I think it's probably wrapped up all the sound stuff into that pick. Actually, that pick is emulating a Z80 and uh, the little bits that hang around that, probably. So what was annoying yesterday is I did test, and I removed the dots, I tested more or less all the stuff down here as well. Um, and it was something from when I originally fitted the socket. So I've just stuck another credit in, let's uh, just test it again here, let's just see if it's doing the punch noises. So if I move the player around, punch. Yeah, you can hear that. I can't get much volume out of it, but it is working. My monitor is still flickering like mad here, so that's another problem I've got. Uh, and the ATX power supply I was using to test this with blew up yesterday. Uh, that was the other eventful thing that happened. So I need a new power supply. I did take the PSU to pieces to have a look. There are some super burned out resistors in there. And you won't be able to, you know, I won't be able to get the part, the, the, the size off them. The bands are just incinerated. So it's just not worth it. For 15 quid I've ordered a new ATX power supply. And you can see for the moment I've borrowed one out of a, a nearby old PC that will be another video in future. Anyway, coming back to the uh, point on hand, the, the sound here. So what are we going to do about this? Well, the amplifier, I've uh, had a look on eBay on faulty versions of this board. And I see one, and I see an amp there, and I can just about read the first few digits. It's a, an NEC UPC12, and I can't read the last two digits. Now, you might think, oh, that's enough to go on. Well, you try and search Google and eBay for those few first few digits and you'll find about six or seven or eight different products from NEC that begin with that uh, you know UPC 12 code. Uh, some of them have 8 pin, you'd think that would be a clue, I've looked at those and all I see is a single channel amplifier but you know what that might be right because having seen what I've seen here we've got that and that seems to be all of the audio mixed doesn't it? So this output's mono. I don't think it's stereo. I think that's another difference. I think if you've got a CPS 1.5 board, an official Capcom board, you'd find it's got two channels, it's got left and right, and there's probably a few different things that get merged across, you know, so you've got like a left channel, right channel, you get some stuff in the center, if that makes sense. Well, you're gonna get that with left and right audio anyway, just, you know, by virtue of how it can be used. But the point is, I think this is a single channel. I think the pick is generating the audio here, it's uh, feed, spoon feeding PCM data into this, and I kind of sidetrack that. I'll perhaps show you a, a picture of the data sheet for this. It's clusters of vo speech synthesis chip or something, the way it says on the data sheet. It's a bit weird. Basically, it handles, you know, you can spoon feed it PCM data. So it's more of a, a DAC. I think, well, yeah, it contains some of the DAC elements. It's more than just a DAC, I guess. Um, and then you've just got an op amp here for the, you know, the preamp stage. It goes to the amplifier. So I think, based on that, we can probably take tap the output from this here. If I can trace it from from here now into here, work out where the output goes, and we can do that on here. The output pins are the corner pins. Let me just put a credit in again. I'll do that while we're here. Start it. Yeah, I looked up the data sheet of an LM324, it's just a 324 op amp. And let's just probe these corner pins. Now this is where, if we're not getting audio here, we might have a fault. And I think we've got a fault. So this explains perhaps why that amp was missed at the back. Someone's, this has had an audio fault, someone's tried to fix it, and failed. Yeah, no audio. Now obviously this volume part here could be part of the issue yeah the one thing I did note is the audio gets coupled through this cap so maybe this cap is faulty maybe it's, we're gonna have audio on one side and we do but not on the other oh we do have audio on the other so we know it's not that cap and this is what you've got to do, you've got to try and follow it and it goes through some resistors and things and into here and then out so it might be that this 324 is faulty actually it really could be that simple or again it could be one of these other coupling caps there are two caps that have been chopped off the board at the back there maybe it kind of goes in and out and then goes through those and somewhere else so anyway i'll spend a little bit of time uh, focusing on that now and i'll show you up close when we reflow this this needs reflowing it looks crusty as anything and it says ad65 on it that it's actually an oaky uh, uh, is it an m6295 it's a something 6295 so yeah, it's interesting how to put these cryptic codes on some of these parts like this to throw you. But that code there, the 6295, is the thing that gives it away as being an Oki. 
6295. I've just worked out that the input to this audio amplifier here is pin 1. I'll show you that. If I put that on there, you can hear the audio. And if I adjust the pot, hang on. Can you hear that? So the pot is adjusting the preamp stage. It doesn't adjust it at the amplifier. Uh, and it's just that first pin. If we go to the others, yeah, there's nothing here. I've got to be careful because I know from measuring before, the top pin up here is 12 volts. So those are grounds, nothing, nothing. So yeah, it's single channel. That also gives me confidence that when I was looking up the part numbers here for this, and I found a single channel one that's eight pin that starts UPC 12, it's the right part. So I'm going to order one of those actually. That is definitely going to be the right part. I think something like a 1224 or 1225 or something like that. But what I think I'll do now is I'm going to tap off that uh, pin there and connect a little FOMO socket or something as a fly lead off the back of this so that I can connect that up to the monitor here and to the TV and stuff later. Uh, you can see why I want to replace that. I don't know that that's going to come out well in the capture. Can you saw that poo around it? <laughs> yeah, that is awful. You know what, maybe it doesn't need a reflow. Maybe it's just the flux there. I'm going to reflow it anyway. We'll just get rid of all this uh, crusty brown stuff from around here and get some fresh chip quick on it and uh, give it a quick reflow while we're here and then I think the next thing I'm going to do as I say I'm going to fit the auto connector but I'm going to remove these caps we'll replace these caps here so recap it let's uh, just clean a wider area under there some of these components are folded in such a way that they're almost short but they don't I don't need to go crazy here because I'm going to be cleaning again in a minute when we've uh, had a solder around here so I've got some flux around that, I'm using the not so crusty Antex, you can see it looks brand new. <laughs> if you saw in a previous video, I replaced the uh, tip, so uh, I don't need that much solder on there, so let's just uh, get rid of that. I just need a tiny, tiny little bit, that'll do. And we'll start down here, I think. Look at that, that looks new. I'm at the wrong angle here for this. I need to be side on really. But anyway, we'll just bob in and out of these. There we go. You can see I removed the excess there as well. There was uh, quite a lot of excess in that corner. Let's do this side. Be careful not to bridge anything here. It's not so bad. So all four sides reflowed. Oh, it's just looking so much better. It looks like a new chip. It really does. I think the flux was the main thing around there. You know what? It really didn't perhaps need a reflow. But uh, anyway, it looks better for having had that done. So I've just got some IPA on there, we'll have uh, a bit of a toothbrush around here. So I'm just going to pull these caps through actually, I think this is the first one. There's barely anything there to solder onto, look. Point's so small. That's one thing you've got to be careful on these though. Don't use too much heat for too long because the points are so small. There we go, that's that one off. Uh, God, that stinks. I did uh, measure the... Uh, I did mark the board as well with a, a red dot just to indicate the positive because it's uh, there's nothing on there from factory. And the other one microfarad is here, I think. Is it? Yep. Come on, melt. There we go, it's just hanging on that side a bit, I think. That's it. So that's the crusty ones out. So the positives on these two uh, are both on this side here. So, yeah, I'll just mark that. Wipe those off in a minute. Negatives uh, this way. There we go. So I'll clean around here now, I've unblocked the holes for those two 
caps there. Uh, I've just marked those white, the red dots off of them. Uh, I know where they were anyway. And the positives were down this end, negatives towards the jammer. Oh no, I'm out of Panasonic, so all I've got is these Satan, uh, sorry, Suntan, pretty much the same thing, uh, caps here, uh, so for the ones that is, they'll be alright just for coupling the audio, um, yeah, maybe this is all this board deserves to be honest, being it being a crusty bootleg, but uh, yeah, it'll do the job, it's better than the ones that are already on there. So, let's solder the first one, one two. Run that right down, and then we'll just give them a reflow, and just reflow to shape them accordingly. That'll do. There we go. One down, three to go. So I've replaced all the electrolytics here, uh, and I'd only had a combination of Forever and Suntan, but you know what? It's probably better than this board deserves, to be honest. Uh, if the light usage is going to get, it will be fine. This is not going to be heavily used. These are the uh, configuration points here. I think, and I could be wrong, uh, well I know, the test pad comes here, test mode. It doesn't go into test mode. I'm guessing something's got to be configured somewhere here. Um, these are like the equivalents of the dip switches. In fact, there is a position for dip switches somewhere. I don't know where it's gone now. Yeah, it's here, look. Dip switches. So, I'm just gently cleaning this. This is the least abrasive fiberglass pen bristles I have actually that you've got to press really hard to affect the board but I'm just going to clean this area up because I might do some testing here to see if I can work out what those dip switches do. I might even fit some dip switches. But the final thing I want to do right now other than just some clean up work here is swap out three or four of the ceramic you know the disc type capacitors because the you know they get chipped and cracked when these boards are stacked and thrown around and stored etc and there's certainly a few on here like that. I'm just going to test this diode. I'm curious as to what this does. Is this reverse polarity protection or what? So this is a ground. Let's see if one side's ground. Yeah, the negative side is ground. And I'm guessing the positive side is going to go to 5 volts, which is in the middle, I think. I forget where the 5 volts is now. It might be one of these here. Let's just test from that chip there. Yeah, there you go. So it's got some reverse polarity protection there. That's what that diode is. Yeah, can you see there? It's split. It's got a big crack in it. That needs swapping out for sure. I think we'd swap that one as well. It looks squished on the edge there. You can see this one here has been broken. It's a bit smaller, so it's not a 104. I mean, one or two of these like that, they've got a little bit of a scratch on top. I'm not worried about that. It's okay, it's in one piece. Uh, but we'll swap that one out and I might have to swap this one out it's a bit battered up on top there um, and because of the location that's in I don't think that's just smoothing a uh, supply or something like that you know it's not just a, de a decoupling cab it's fixing timing on something there so that is more important so so far all these disc caps have been uh, 104s you know marked 104 which is 100 nanofarad this one here is marked 101 which is uh, 100 picofarad. There's still a bit of a leg there, look. That was where it was broke off. I need to get that leg out and get this new cap in. Mm -hmm. And that 101 that I just fitted was related to timing as well. I'm just going to reflow these here. So I've got two caps here that are 101s that are cleaning up edges on clock signals probably or something like that. It could be acting as like a bit of a filter just to lay the uh, falling edge of a signal. Uh, let's just turn that leg up there. I'm going to mount this differently so that it doesn't protrude and get caught and scratched if it's ever uh, got anything on top of it. So what I'll do is bend that leg up. I'm going to mount it down here like this. So get our solder point there. Yeah. Uh, and then we can mount the wire on the top where it was. Anyway, you get the general idea. I just need to just squash that in a bit. 
so consider this as a just bonus footage really it's not worthy of a video on its own the 1084 you saw the sync issue there one thing i found is if i left the monitor on for i don't know maybe five minutes and then connect the jammer up you know the uh, the board we're testing in this video the punisher the sync would be a lot better so it made me wonder if there's still something wrong with my 1084s monitor here now the one thing I didn't do when I did that repair was check any of the tantalums and I've just replaced two. Can you see this open circuit, low capacitance? This should be 0.33 and yeah it's open circuit and the other one was one microfarad tantalum so there's only two others on the board that I haven't done and uh, let me show you this one. This again is problematic. Watch the resistance on it. So we've got uh, 22 ohms there or microfarad, so the microfarad rating is right, but an ESR of 22 ohms, that has turned into a resistor. So, it was a good job I came in here to do these. Whether that's going to solve the sync issue, I don't know. When I did this repair, I didn't replace every single cap, almost every single cap, just a few of the smaller ones at the back. Uh, anyway, looking at the schematics, I've got a few pointers, things I want to check. So there's a few caps, I'm just going to go around and measure them. You know, desolder, one pin, check it on the ESR meter, and if it's okay, I'll leave it. If it needs swapping, I'll swap it. So the other three caps that I swapped out while I was in the 1084S here, uh, what's this one? That one's a 10. You can see it's 1.3 ohms. It's probably not far off what it was new, really. The ESR on these is not too bad. Uh, they're like 50 volts or something, and that's the, the thing, really. When you have higher voltage, you'll find the ESR is between 1 and 1.5 one and ohms, generally. Um, but the ones I've fitted are a lot low, lower in terms of ESR, like 0.4. So it won't do any harm to swap those. And the ones I target there, when I was looking at the schematics, I just picked... Some of the ones I've not done, there's not very many, there's probably only about 10 or 20 on there that I haven't done, but they're all smaller ones like this, nowhere near the high voltage side. Anyway, I target the ones around the uh, sink area actually. You know what, I'm not going to waste any more time messing with my monitor. Trying to convince myself there's a fault with my monitor isn't the answer. As you can see, this is from a cold power on. Now I tested with the, the Punisher there a minute ago and it was flickering like mad. It was proving difficult to get it to sync. But as you can see, just connecting the Mega Drive up without doing anything at all is perfect. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, there's some uh, stuff going on at the top here. I think that's probably the sync on the Mega Drive causing that. But you know what? The picture is crystal clear and it's synchronized. So there's nothing wrong with my monitor. However, it was worth swapping out those uh, tantalums. I, I did swap one or two of the caps while I was there, but I couldn't really find anything wrong with it. While we're here, I thought, why not look at the uh, Mega Drive version of the Punisher? Yeah, it's not very good. You know, when the game starts, you don't get the uh, crazy voice sample, whatever it is he says as he comes down out of the roof. Uh, yeah, I've never understood that, but it's, it's part of the game. It's kind of like one of the things that people associate with the Punisher. Uh, and the cool Q sound music as well, it doesn't translate very well to the Mega Drive. It's funny, my recollection of this game, I always thought this was a really good port on the Mega Drive, but you know what, it's not. Yeah, the colours and things are quite nice. Um, but just watch when you do the fast move thing, if I, you know, tap right or tap left. On the arcade version, super quick, I can show you that in a second. And on here, it's pretty slow. That's it. That is so slow. So, yeah, the Mega Drive was certainly capable of doing it. But it's not a very good port, I don't think. The other thing I've just done with this monitor is just the east-west correction. The pin cushion uh, variable resistor. So, it still looks, I don't know, it's, it's pretty straight, actually. Because the screen is actually curved. So, this here is going to be nearer to the edge. But the sides here are much straighter. There's a little bit of a curve there. Those are the sorts of things you need to uh, adjust with like magnets on the back of the tube, uh, I think. So yeah, that's filling the picture. I've extended it out so it completely fills the picture and I'm pretty happy with that actually. It's as straight as that's gonna get. It's interlaced so it's flickering like mad, just like it does on my LCD TV, incidentally. 
So with the east-west correction, the uh, pin cushion adjustment there, if I just uh, draw the sides of the screen here, and those aren't very straight lines, so you should have nice straight lines at the edge. What was happening, and I saw it m more noticeably actually on the when the high score list was scrolling by, you might see that very early on in the video at that point, uh, when I was first testing it, it kind of went like that there and on this side here it kind of went like that and now it was uh, perhaps not that angle it was very close to that half maybe half that it was quite a noticeable curve on both sides uh, and i noticed it more actually on the amiga when i was testing with the uh, 4000 there on the desktop i could see certainly when it was pulled in from the edges a little bit it was curving in like that there so that was a sign to me that the east west and this is where the name east west comes from you know east west correction uh, and i think what you do is you, you adjust that pot and it affects some pwm signal it compensates for this curve you know that you adjust that pot it kind of like pulls this section of the screen out to here um, but it does it in such a way that it, it you know it, it's variable you know it starts at the top here and it has to do very little by the time you get to the middle here it has to do quite a lot um, so yeah just some fine adjustment of that and you can straighten it out the ideal way to do it is to put a mirror in front of the TV so you can see what you're adjusting from the back. But I couldn't do that. I had the cats here. I didn't want high voltage on while the cats were around. So I literally carefully took the lid off, tweaked it a tiny little bit of that pot, put the lid back on, a single screw in place and retested it. And I could see it gradually, gradually, gradually coming this way. I adjusted it, kid you not, about five times before it looks perfectly straight. At some point, perhaps, when the cats aren't around, uh, you know, when I've got more time and stuff, I might adjust it that way using a mirror and then just, uh, you know, tweak it. Use a plastic adjustment tool. Don't use a metal screwdriver if you're doing it while it's on. So let's have a go at trying to remove these labels. I think for the most part I'm going to peel it back first and then get the IPA onto it. So I've removed most of the label there, you can see. We'll just uh, try and get the last little bits off with IPA. So I can now give you a quick look and listen to this. The first thing to note, you'll notice that there's no attract sound. There are no dip switches on this. Now I did experiment uh, shorting some of the uh, pins there that do go to where the dip switches should be doesn't do anything the test button doesn't do anything there's no test mode now the sync issue I was having with this monitor you know it was useful to do the things I did to this monitor in this video and I'll show you that adjustment in a minute for the east west correction uh, you know it was bowing in quite considerably actually on the Amiga desktop there were quite noticeable bow shapes like that in the corners and you can see now it's really straight there's a little bit of distortion up here on this side to the left side just on this game strangely enough and i think it's the sink on this now the sink issues if i move it to the left it starts to stabilize move it to the right watch this fill the screen it goes crazy it cannot lock onto that sink i think it's just this board this arcade board so for the purposes of this demo here i'm scrolled off to the left hand side a little bit there it's the only way i can get it working at the moment if you know how to get around that please let me know i'm thinking maybe a sink stripper or a sink cleaner or something you know you can get something that sits in between a board like this and uh, you know your monitor so i've stuck a credit in there let's uh, hit start i'm not going to show you too much so the first impressions there it's not bad yeah the sound's nowhere near as good as it would be let's just turn the sound down a smidge actually yeah the sound is nowhere near as good as an original cps 1.5 board without a doubt i think those boards are stereo this one's mono but they've reduced uh, the sample sizes and sample rate and all that sort of stuff and it is just mono and of course, it's being generated by that pick 16C57, I think it is. And if you're familiar with the original game, you'll notice that music is just looping. It's like a short section of about, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds of music, and it just loops. The other thing, and I'll perhaps cut to showing you this bit, I'll jump to the boss if I can. And when we get to the boss, you'll notice that when certain things happen, like the laser fires, you lose the music. The music just stops. Now, I've compared to uh, footage on YouTube of this, you know, the bootleg of this. The same thing happens on all of them. So it's not like there's something wrong with the board still. It's just a crap bootleg. I don't know why they would go to the effort of replicating, you know, producing a board like this, manufacturing it, with all of the reverse engineering stuff involved, 
and then cut some corners. Why cut corners? If you're going to create a bootleg and you want to make money off it, do a good job of it. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a criminal activity that you know that someone undertook to create these, copy, you know, breaking copyright, copying the games, and uh, selling them off as their own for considerably less, or just sticking them in their own arcades or something and making lots of money for from you know less investment. But as a consumer, you know, you get a lesser experience. The music here again will loop on a short loop. The gameplay is identical. The graphics and sprites and things look identical. I don't think they've cut anything. There's only two buttons on this, I think. You can see it's still bobbing up and down a little bit with the sync issues there. It's not the monitor. So it's still a fun game to play, but yeah, I wouldn't rush out to buy a bootleg of the Punisher. If you were going to buy one, I'd say it's worth about all of about 20 quid, maybe 50 quid if it's in pristine condition, but uh, gameplay-wise, uh, it's nowhere near as good as the original because the sound and stuff just kind of spoils a little bit. I mean, it's not so bad so far. So far, you'd be thinking, yeah, it's not bad, actually. That's almost identical to the arcade. Apart from this blue background, it should be black. Everywhere you've got this light blue, it should be black. Can you see this little flicker in here as well? That's some sort of artifact that only occurs on the bootleg. Sound there's not bad. You get the alarm noises and things as you invade this uh, hideout here. But listen to the music. Just loops, it's like literally a 20 second loop. You could hear it stop and start there actually as it ended the section. As far as I can see, there's one 512k chip for the sound. The original board I think has got two meg. And that's the thing, you've got a quarter of the amount of uh, storage there for sound. So they've cut 75% of the sound out of the game. Uh, something else I'll point out, you see we are stood behind that tree and that works okay. There's a bit later in the game and I'll fast forward in a minute just to show you that, where there's no priority being added and you actually walk in front of a tree like that and it just looks really wrong. Uh, and I think someone's just got lazy, they perhaps didn't play test it all the way through and they got lazy and haven't dealt with that uh, you know, background sprite, no, it might be a sprite or something but some priority there on that layer so that you go behind it. I just want to show you this because you'll see the sound will cut out. Do you hear that? Music's gone. Yeah, it, who play tested that when they were <laughs> deciding this bootleg? It's crap. It is absolutely crap. No music on the next boss. Ooh, bonus stage. Oh, that went too quick, no way, get it. So what feels like an eternity, it took ages playing through this, it's painful. Here we go, what's this tree? You might think, oh, what behind that tree, look, we're on top of it. Yeah, that just completely spoils the immersion of the really bad music and everything. I said I would show you where the pincushion adjustment was for the east-west correction, it's there. It's that little veil resistor, I think it's like 323, it's marked on the board. It was wound all the way anti-clockwise. Somebody has tinkered with these settings I'm sure on this because one of the things I had to do when I got this working was adjust lots of things, they were well out. Uh, so I think someone tinkered around with that to try and solve the original problem before it was sold on to me. Now the arcing that happened earlier on, I can't be sure, it's possible the line output transformers uh, glitching occasionally on this, but uh, other than a strong smell of ozone, and I can't find any signs of an arc anywhere, and that, that might point to the transformer, um, the only other thing I found is when I was trying to investigate the issue there, round here I noticed there was a dead uh, spider, I've cleaned most of it out, and it was right between this side I think here and the earth, and it was like vaporised. 
um, and I could smell something had burnt and that was why I then took it to pieces I couldn't find anything inside at all that would have burnt and or nothing no arcing marks or anything so I think it was a dead bug in there making the mains level a bit low while it was shorting to earth I think that's what's happened I'm surprised it didn't trip the mains but it, I think if anything it was actually stopping the pin making a connection very well so the voltage would have been low so having 240 volts in the UK maybe it was down to 200 or less or something like that while that was uh, disintegrating uh, but it did resolve itself after a very short period of time and certainly after I cleaned it out I've never had the problem since so I'll just clean around there now And there we go, not too bad. So for the missing audio amplifier, I'm guessing it could be something like that, the UPC 1224 there, because you can see it's SIP 8, 8 pins, 15 quid plus shipping, uh, no thanks. That's one reason why I opted not to fit uh, the amplifier on this. What you need to do is look at the data sheet of this and see if input's on, is it pin 1? I think it might be. Um, and then just you know just check the other pins the supply was the other pin at the other end wasn't it the uppermost pin so yeah that might be the right part i don't know but you can see that's what i went with here you know so it's preamp output you know so i've just connected that to my monitor you could fit any kind of other amplifier on here the ground obviously is the black way the white is uh, you know but they've got the square around it marking pin one is the uh, audio and you can see we fitted brand new caps on here yeah all right some of these are the satan <laughs> uh, suntan uh, ones and then i think the others are forever i swapped that one out and i swapped that one out originally it had axial caps on it you know the ones where the uh, legs come out the uh, tops you know the top parts here and the bottom part and it went from here to over there but there was another pad nearby that was just unblocked so you could fit the uh, radial type and it was exactly the same with that one that was an axial went from uh, over here somewhere i think to over here and we swapped out that cap as well and then just tucked it down here so it won't get uh, squished in future and that one as well those were both a different size to these other disc caps and i think the only other ceramics i replaced were these two here and of course r174 i went with an ls174 i think i think i tried a hc and an f and it didn't seem to make any difference so i just left an ls on there cleaned up this area here all the horrible sticker removed and i've labeled it up to show what it is and uh, when it was recapped so a special thanks to electron ash for sending this along with a few other bits you'll uh, might have seen the a3020 and there's uh, some more interesting things coming up as well including a sega megatech board i'm looking forward to looking at that one in particular yeah so i think i first discovered electron ash's channel actually and he was doing stuff with lasers he was you know controlling uh, the scan of a laser and etching things and experimenting with all that sort of side of things but he's a very smart guy he's kind of up there with the likes of stephen leary uh, you know he's good at reverse engineering stuff he's good at writing vhdl and uh, playing with uh, you know tinkering with fpgas he's actually also one of the contributors to some of the uh, you know the the cores for the mister you know fpga based uh, repl replacement of arcade boards he did some work on the cps stuff i think i vaguely remember him uh, doing something like that um in any case yeah he has had you know an involvement so he's been supporting some of the people who've been creating the cause and uh, helping uh, you know tweak some of the bugs and things out himself and besides that, Electron Ash has done quite a number of his own little projects with FPGAs, actually. He took the chipset, I think, from a Saturn or something and, and created a board for that. And I think even the Dreamcast, I was playing around with the Dreamcast for a while and creating a new PCB for that. And something is niggling in my mind, reminding me about the 32X. I think he created a replacement 32X. I'm not sure which of those projects have uh, come to fruition. I think it's a case of he's, he's like uh, a lot of us trying to work on too many things at once. So yeah, a very clever guy. And uh, I am very much appreciative of him sending this stuff. So I do hope you found the video interesting and I hope I haven't uh, stressed you out too much with all the flickering on that CRT. My CRT is fine. I tested it extensively yesterday on various systems here. And you know what? It locks on perfectly to every signal I throw at it apart from this. So uh, I'm not really sure what is going on with it. I did remove the resistor on my uh, jammer adapter there and fit a variable resistor and I played with different levels of attenuation there on the signal. It doesn't make a difference. So all I can think is the sync created by this is just a little bit, uh, what's the word, noisy perhaps. It's not quite as clean and tidy as a sync signal should be and my LCD TV is having none of it. And likewise the 1084 doesn't exactly like it. 
What was interesting about that is if I move the uh, H adjust or whatever to move it to the left, it started to become stable. All of the gameplay stuff you saw, that wasn't as a result of the things they did to the monitor. Those things didn't make a difference, actually. The two tantalum capacitors were related to the composite input. Now, I don't think I've used composite on that monitor, but that, you know, that will have fixed the composite if there was any issues with the composite. Uh, but, yeah, they won't have had any bearing on why this board was not syncing properly. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. I'll catch you in the next video.